So that gets me to a few other questions. I mean, the first question is, is there any role for single agents now, fulvestrant by itself? Is there any role for that? Are we, or are we done with that? Are we just now going to use fulvestrant with a CDK 4.6? I mean, we have that in Monarch 2. We have that in Paloma 3. You know, are we, is, there, is there any reason for single agent fulvestrant anymore? I mean, you still have a 22-month PFS in some of the trials as a single agent. Well, you agent. know, I think we, we all, at least if you have some budget responsibility, would, would, would laugh to have a clear-cut definition of that lowest risk subgroup where this is reasonable. I have to say, in, in joining Joyce in, in her um, initial statement, you know, it's very difficult to identify that. I, I, I'm struggling a little bit with the Falcon trial because um, it was basically in non-pretreated patients and in my environment simply those patients don't exist. Um, so I'm not so sure that, that these uh, PFSs uh, can be translated to where I practice. Uh, in, in our interdisciplinary tumor center, it's really more a backup for patients. For example, you know, I'm from an Alpine country, so some patients live in very remote areas. Whatever you do with targeted combinations, whether that's M2 inhibition, for the side effect management, also CDK4-6 for in the beginning frequent uh, blood count is a logistical challenge for some of the patients and obviously a monthly injection with fatigue as the, as the you know, most terrible side effect can be convenient for some low risk patients, but I would consider it a backup approach at, at this point in time. It's interesting because so. a lot of our patients don't want to do injections. They don't like the two injections, especially my very thin patients. Mm -hmm. I don't right. like it at all. And I, mm -hmm. I think, you know, when we worked really hard on that, I just had big discussions about whether you ice or heat the injection area with That's our crazy. nurses. But yeah. I think um, for a patient who got really tired of the injections and uh, gets bruises all the time, I think that, you know, now with the full vestment being approved first line, it does give us some flexibility. And that's, I, I would take the same approach. It's really the patient, you know. I have some patients who've refused to take CDK4-6 inhibitors. I do live in California, but, you know, they believe that, you know, maybe that's too much therapy or it might do something <laughs> they don't know or they have to, whatever it is. I, I don't understand it. But uh, those are patients, of course, now that you know that you would give full vestrant instead of an AI if they haven't had prior endocrine therapy and they're in the first line setting without visceral disease. So that based on Falcon. So that, you know, it's helpful information, I think, to have, even though most of us really wouldn't find too many patients who we would treat with full vestrant alone. And there's a trial going on in Spain, I think, and uh, with multiple countries um, as part of one of the networks that's, uh, um, I think, Solti, that's looking at um, fulvestrant or an AI with CDK4-6 mm -hmm. inhibitors, first-line mm -hmm. therapy, in a more of a sort of treatment population we mm -hmm. all see, people who've relapsed and were exposed to endocrine therapy before. So again, that, that gets us to some other. So what happens on progression? I mean, where does a varolimus fit in now for mm -hmm. people's practice? Well, Joyce, where do you use a varolimus? So I still do. Um, and when patients benefit from CDK4-6 inhibitors first line, I tend to go on to Everolimus um, second line, with the exception of liver, liver metastasis. In general, I have found um, patients seem to do better with capecitabine. Afterwards, there's the, there's the occasional exception, somebody with extremely indolent um, disease. But in general, um, I have found that patients with what I would consider to be still ER-driven sites of disease, bone, lymph nodes, parenchymal, lung, pleura, they seem to do well on uh, Everolimus. And generally speaking, what I'll do is I'll go on with Eximestane Everolimus, getting them teed up. Because I think if they benefit from Everolimus, I think they re-express that estrogen receptor really well. And then I go on to Fulvestrin single agent next for mm -hmm. those patients. So it's third line. Yes, because third line. if they benefit from Everolimus, I have found that they, they get about six to nine to 10 months from either tamoxifen or to Fulvestrin after Everolimus. Can, can, question to my American colleagues. Um, I fully agree with this statement, but I hear from many of my colleagues in Germany that this is the, not the label of uh, Everolimus. So meaning using Everolimus after a CDK4-6 inhibitor is not on the label. Mm 
But the, pr the yeah, problem I, is that I, there was no label. There's no CD <laughs> six when the label I, was I, developed. There's no cross-reactivity that yeah. we have seen. I think that you know the cross-reactivity you have is resistance to endocrine therapy. Right, so it's an ESR mutation, if anything. If, right. Yeah, if you've developed a cancer that's very resistant to all endocrine therapy, sort of you know explosive visceral disease, that's a different situation. But you know, I've had patients who responded to Everolimus who didn't respond to CDK4-6 inhibition, mm. who presented with visceral metastases um, on adjuvant tamoxifen. And, you know, the, it's, I have had a patient who also responded to Everolimus and then responded to a PI3 kinase inhibitor for four times longer, mm. you know, but still had a good response. So I think, you know, all of that clinical experience makes you realize that we don't really understand which resistance mechanism is playing a role and that these drugs can be used in sequence in many situations with great efficacy. And, you know, from a clinical point of view, I think it, in general it's fair <coughs> to say that M2 inhibition has been pushed back at least one line yeah. by the adjuvant of CDK46. Right. Having said this, clinically, I think in addition to presumed resistance in an individual patient, it, this is really a lot about the side effect profile. I mean, mucositis can be an issue even now that we know better how to deal Absolutely. with it. Um, you know, pneumonitis can be severe and, and actually is a concern also for patients. And you know, some of our patients are now, you tell me we can avoid chemotherapy as compared to uh, earlier than you treat me with CDK. I have the same or equally looking side effect, neutropenia and then I go to the next stage and then I get mucositis, which is also <laughs> a traditional chemotherapy <laughs> side effect, so what is the, which is obviously right. not true, but I think right. it, it, in clinical sequencing of all this, we are urgently needing better tools of finding a rational way because it's really try and error in many of, of these patients. Well, speaking of try and error and rational tools, I mean, let's finish this section talking about PI3 kinase inhibitors. I mean, I think that at least the initial you know, phase three trials, randomized phase three trials in the, in the relapse setting, you know, or after the first or second line of endocrine therapy have really been modest at best. And so, I mean, I think that where are we going with PI3 kinase inhibitors? Uh, you know, it's so funny because I think that, you know, when we saw the data from uh, pictilisib, which is a Fergie trial that wasn't too exciting and a lot of toxicity. Then we saw these two Bell trials with buparlicib, and buparlicib is a drug that has unacceptable toxicity in this patient population, but, what I thought was really exciting about those trials was, yes, in the whole population, not much, you know, little benefit, right? But if you, one of the trials actually was able to compare PI3 kinase activating mutations in blood versus tumor and see a very high concordance, which I think took us a big leap ahead in our ability to use blood and show that the benefit <coughs> was greater in that population. So the two trials that are looking at what we think are the, you know, the most I think promising step in PI3 kinase inhibition, the mostly alpha-specific uh, alpelisib and uh, tacelisib, they actually are powered to look at the cohort that have PI3 kinase activating mutations as best as we can check it from tumor because that's how they're doing it. And we're hoping by the end of the year to see the first one of these trials, uh, the Sandpiper trial with tacelisib.